Since the beginning of the war, the two most powerful navies in the world had failed to decisively engage. The British Navy instead blockading the Germans to deprive them of supplies, the Germans harassing international shipping with U-boats. But that changes this week when mighty ships clash. 100 years ago this week was the Battle of Jutland. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week at Verdun, the French tried and failed to retake Fort Douaumont, even though they had managed to achieve air superiority there. And the Austro-Hungarian Imperial Army continued its advance in Italy in the Trentino Offensive. I'll look there first today, as that offensive continued this week. Now, within two weeks of the initial attacks, Italian Army Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna had managed to get a new army of 180,000 men to the Trentino, and the Italian 5th Army would guard the valley mounts, hopefully to prevent the Austrians from spilling out onto the plains of Veneto. But this week, the Austrians took Arciero, just a few kilometers from the plains. Asiago soon fell as well, and Cadorna exploded heads in the government by saying that if enemy pressure continued, he would order a full-scale retreat almost to Venice. 30,000 Italian prisoners had been taken so far. The week also saw some action on the Western Front. The endless meat grinder at Verdun was still in full force. But further north at Ypres, the Battle of Mont Sorel, in older sources sometimes called the Third Battle of Ypres, began on June the 2nd and saw two German attacks that penetrated the British lines 700 meters on a three kilometer front. The road to Ypres was now open and undefended. The real news this week, though, was at sea. Both the British and German fleets were by this time becoming more aggressive. Commander of the British fleet, Sir John Jellicoe, wanted to trap the German high seas fleet, and his opposite number, Reinhard Scher, was trying to force a mistake. Scher sent his fleet into the Skagerrak to attack any British light forces and shipping there. But the 16 German battleships and six pre-dreadnoughts, five battle cruisers, 11 light cruisers, and 63 destroyers also wanted to come into contact with the British Grand Fleet, hoping to break it and the naval blockade of Germany. However, aided by the intelligence operatives of Room 40, who decoded German wireless signals, Jellico was forewarned and sent out his fleet. But the British were, in fact, heading into a trap. There were nearly a score of U-boats waiting for them. But Scher would be disappointed, since the ocean is big, and the Grand Fleet, 28 British battleships, 9 battle cruisers, 34 light and armored cruisers, and 78 destroyers, passed them unobserved. The Battle of Jutland would bring four leading admiral skills into play. Scher and Franz Hipper for the Germans, Jellico and Sir David Beatty for the British. The enemies made contact when both sides went to check out a merchant ship that happened to be sailing between the fleets. Firing between cruisers kicked off at 2.28 in the afternoon of May 31st, 1916, and the Battle of Jutland had begun. Hipper and his battle cruisers headed south, trying to draw Beatty in to Scher's main fleet, still unseen. Beatty followed, aboard his flagship, the Lion. Fire opened between them at 348. The Lion was hit and burst into flames and would have sunk if the magazine hadn't flooded and put out the fire. The British Indefatigable was hit by two 11-inch shells from the German von der Tam that blew up the whole ship and killed all except two of the ship's 1,019 sailors. Then the Queen Mary was hit and blew to pieces. 1,266 men were killed. Beatty seemed unmoved. And here's the reaction of his flag captain, Alfred Chatfield. I was standing beside Sir David Beatty, and we both turned around in time to see the unpleasant spectacle. The thought of my friends in her flashed through my mind. I thought also how lucky we had evidently been in the lion. Beatty turned to me and said, there seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today. A remark that needed neither comment nor answer. There was something wrong. What was wrong was that the British battlecruiser armor was not thick enough to handle the German shells. And once a shell had penetrated the hull, inadequate anti-flash precautions meant that a flash could rip straight down to the magazine with terrifying results. No ship on Earth could survive explosions like that. Soon, Hipper had led Beatty almost into Cher's fleet, but Beatty's second light cruiser squadron was scouting ahead and spotted the long line of German battleships. Beatty actually reacted like lightning, reversing course immediately and heading back towards the Grand Fleet. And Cher didn't realize that every minute he headed north brought him closer to Jellicoe and his massed ships. 
Beatty, however, sent Jellico no useful reports about Scher's whereabouts, and soon Jellico's starboard column was upon the Germans. The first cruiser squadron under Rear Admiral Sir Robert Arbuthnot aboard the defense came under heavy fire, and in a few seconds, the defense was sent to the bottom of the sea. Soon, though, Jellicoe's battle cruisers were showering shells upon hippers, and because of the light and the mist, the Germans could not see them to fire back. But just for a few moments, the mist cleared, and the Germans rained fire on the Invincible. The British naval maxim that speed would be our armor was put to the test and found wanting when the Invincible exploded at 634. Only six men survived out of 1,032. But Jellicoe's dreadnought battleships were now in a long line, blasting the exposed vanguard of the German fleet, causing serious damage. Scher ordered a turn movement to starboard that the Germans had practiced, where the rear ship would turn first and the successive ships up the line follow suit, and the Germans soon disappeared from sight. Jellicoe did not follow. He changed course and put himself between the German fleet and its base at Wilhelmshaven. And when Scher turned his ships again, they were again headed directly for the British, and they came under heavy fire. He turned his battleships away and ordered his battle cruisers to cover the retreat. They took terrible damage, the kind no British battle cruiser could have withstood. But the Germans had better armor and were better subdivided below into watertight compartments. The Germans got away, but the Grand Fleet was still between the High Seas Fleet and its port. And when darkness fell, the question was, could Cher evade the British by night and return home? Since several of his battlecruisers were near to sinking, Cher took the shortest route, via Horn's Reef. But Jellicoe didn't know this, and based on his last reports received, he thought the northern Frisian coast was the likely German route. So Jellicoe headed there, with his destroyer flotillas following five miles behind to cover the Horn's Reef Channel. So Jellicoe's destroyers crashed into the German fleet, but the British, unlike the Germans, did not have properly shuttered searchlights, no star shells, and pretty much no nighttime identification signals. So they were really wary of firing on the black shapes heading towards them in the darkness in case they were their own ships. Oh, and nobody told Jellicoe, with his mighty dreadnoughts five miles ahead, what was happening. The British did manage to destroy the pre-dreadnought Palmerin, killing her crew of 844, but the High Seas Fleet swept past the British in the night. The battered and bruised German battlecruisers, some even incapable of attack, limped through the British columns and were sighted several times, but none of the dreadnoughts opened fire on the incredulous Germans. The Grand Fleet sailed on, preparing for a new battle at dawn that would not happen. Scher reached Wilhelmshaven in the early afternoon. The Germans lost one battlecruiser, one pre-dreadnought, four light cruisers, and five destroyers. The British lost more, three battlecruisers, three armored cruisers, and eight destroyers. 2,551 German lives were lost against 6,094 British, and the Kaiser commented that the spell of Trafalgar is broken. But here's the thing. The German fleet did not again seek out battle with the British fleet, and Scher wrote to the Kaiser about the battle that real victory could only be achieved by sending U-boats to sink British merchant ships. So the status quo would continue, which for Germany actually meant a strategic defeat. And we come to the end of another week. The Austrians on the move in Italy, the Germans blowing holes in the lines at Ypres, and a gigantic naval battle in the North Sea. And that battle was a real blow for British prestige. I'm going to end today with an observation about the press and propaganda during the war, which we've talked about before, but you can really see it in action this week as the British Admiralty released one communique about the battle and then another with a different spin, thanks to Winston Churchill, which painted things a bit rosier. The upshot of this was scenes like Vera Britton in her London hospital saying, were we celebrating a glorious naval victory or lamenting an ignominious defeat? We hardly knew. Each fresh edition of the newspapers obscured rather than illuminated this really quite important distinction. By this point, though, nobody really knew what was going on anymore. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about wartime propaganda, you can click here for our special episode about it. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Todd Zaragoza. 
If you want to see this show get better and better and cooler and cooler, please consider supporting us on Patreon. And if you want to read a fantastic book about World War I at sea, go to our Amazon shop and check out Castles of Steel. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.